This is a great time of year, as is any time of year, to give your friends, family and perhaps even yourself a gift that will also hug the planet. I'm going to give you a list of my favourite green gifts. Now one or two might make you feel a little squeamish, but please don't poo-poo the idea. I would love any one of them in my stocking. Hello darlings! Christmas is coming! We're all being encouraged to plant trees for the planet and probably the number one tree that we're thinking about at this time of year is the Christmas tree. So I've got this lovely Pinus niger, which I've had for a few years now. Um, I think it's a wonderful tree. And when I've brought it into the house, you see I've potted it up now, put it in the pot, I'll bring it into the house and it will be perfect. They're brilliant, they don't drop pine needles so much all over the floor and they are fabulous to have. But come the end of Christmas, I'll lift it out of the pot, I'll put it into a root control bag, which will stop any roots bigger than three millimetres escaping through it, and then I'll plunge it all into the ground. That way I won't have to water it so much as if it was in a pot all the year round. It will grow better because some of the feeding roots can grow through into the soil. I will probably have to water it in dry periods at the beginning of spring, which we often get, just to make sure it really makes that transition into the soil. And then what I love about it is I can improve it year on year. I can gently prune the sides and get that really magical Christmas tree shape, that pyramidal shape, which we all love. And this tree, this Pinus nigra, will last me all my life. I think it's wonderful. Another sort of tree that's very festive is the mistletoe tree. Now, you can graft mistletoe or you can encourage mistletoe to grow in many different trees, but they're renowned for growing in fruit trees. I've just purchased two little mistletoe trees, which are apple trees, Bramley apple trees, 106 rootstock, so it's fairly vigorous because it does need to cope with having mistletoe living in it. And these have been implanted with mistletoe. They'd, so they've smeared mistletoe berries into little crevices under limbs and things like that in the apex of joints. And they did that about two years ago. And now, two years on, we see the fruits of the labour and we've got these tiny little green leaves poking out showing that it's got established. Obviously in nature, we have missile thrushes and birds that love the berries. They pluck the juicy white berries and then they wipe their beak into the, the bark of the tree or else their back end when they poo into the bark of the tree. And that helps get the mistletoe started into the tree. So you can either start next spring with the really overripe berries, get some and rub them into your trees, ready to lift to give to people in maybe two years time when you've got them actually growing in them, or you can actually buy mistletoe trees ready impregnated. And then you've got your own harvestable mistletoe, which is lovely and a good excuse for a little peck under the tree if you feel so inclined. But of course, any tree for Christmas, if someone's got the space, is a wonderful green present to give. Mud is my favourite building material. It looks beautiful. It lasts forever. There are lots of medieval mud buildings still around. So if you build them correctly, they are very long lasting. They're extremely economical. We made this mud hut with Anthony Goode, who's a mud specialist, and we just got some subsoil from the field next door. We got some straw, a little bit of lime and water. So your mix is? It's three portions of soil. One portion of sharp sand, yes. two shovelfuls of lime, with a generous sprinkling of barley straw. It's very like it's like a Jamie Oliver recipe, isn't it? <laughs> one hand of this instead of at six ounces or exact measurements. It's all very ad hoc. <laughs> and instead of using animals and shredding it like they would have done in sort of medieval times, we bought an, a JCB from next door too. And we just worked the mud and then we piled it up in 600 millimetre layers, let each layer dry out and then put the next one on. And the key thing with mud buildings, they've got to have a dry feet. So we've got this little stone wall at the bottom and we've got a lot of overhang on the thatch on the top. And this must have been here for 
15 years and it was amazingly fun to make we all enjoyed it we all got stuck in it's got a very good use which i'll show you later but it, it's a brilliant building i think but if you don't want a mud hut think tandoori oven think maybe outdoor fireplace think garden wall or if you're feeling really adventurous and you get the bit between your teeth think build your own house it will be the most economical building material that you could possibly use the most green and ecological and I think the most beautiful so if you're at a loss of what to give someone this would probably be their most surprising present a mud building course a book a video or you could actually get them started on a fantastic project right now We've all been told to conserve water and it seems to come in massive deluges and then we get incredible droughts. So I think having water butts, as many as you can of them, is really helpful for gardening. And I like them also because you can just dip the can in and water, you don't have to wait for the can to fill. But getting nice looking water butts is not always easy. I mean, the beautiful old lead ones are fabulous, but my, they cost. So I got an old black plastic tank. This was just being chucked out and I wanted to make it look a bit more attractive. So what I did is I painted it with a primer and I use Zinza 123 water-based primer and then their paints will actually stick and adhere onto the plastic and I wanted to give it a faux lead finish so I got a black and a white zinza paint I put them onto the tank in separate blobs and then I just painted streaks down them to get that sort of runny look that you get from lead it sort of drips down as it weathers and you get a mix of different tones of greys and an almost sort of white powdery look so you get a nice range of colour by applying it that way onto the tank what you don't want is really a flat uniform paint finish and then it really is a giveaway that it is not lead but also the shape of this tank was well not really a shape you would expect to get from lead so I got some motifs I got some plastic motifs from P Peter Evans studios now if you think plastic is not good for the planet you could leave these off or you could get little lead ones little lead bosses that you could put on or metal bosses but the plastic ones come in all different shapes and sizes they're incredibly cheap and they will also take any paint color so I stuck those onto the tank and gave them a similar finish we've often done this and used them as water butts but because I've actually got quite a few in this instance I'm actually going to plant it up I've planted it up at the moment with some ferns and a yew but that's really just temporary I've got a nice big gunnera and gunnera are wonderful moisture loving plants and they like moisture moist soils which is one thing I definitely don't have in this garden so I'm just going to puncture the tank with a couple of holes at the bottom so the drainage is impeded but it holds the water but it will actually drain a bit and then I'm going to pot the gunner in come spring it's slightly tender plant so I want to plant it in spring when the frosts have gone but um, I love water tanks I've got all sorts of ones from barrels to ones I've got off eBay to plastic barrels that I've actually covered with code for lead um, but I like them to look good I don't like the off the peg bought plastic ones I always like to do something with them to make them more of a garden feature and I think if you gave any gardener a good looking water butt for Christmas or any gift I would be thrilled and I'm sure they would be to bits and could always find somewhere to put it Instead of giving someone a day in a beauty parlour, why not give them a day with a shredder? Now this might sound absolutely bonkers and you could can of course buy shredders but in my experience the domestic ones are really quite hard work, loud, noisy and can be very difficult to start but big commercial shred shredders are wonderful, they just zip through everything. Now what is it that you want from your shredder? Well what you want is the ramiel and ramiel is a generic name given to all sorts of shreddings from trees. They're from wood that is up to 75 millimeters across so that sort of diameter and it's live wood, it's with 
buds, leaves and everything. So it's all the prunings you're getting from your bushes and trees and things like that. And when you put it through the shredder, it forms this amazing mulch type stuff, but better than mulch because it's fresh green live wood. And it rots down, you put it on the soil and you'll put it about 50 to 100 millimetres thick. You won't usually put it immediately, you'll wait for it to settle for about three months so any tannic acid comes out. And then you apply it to the soil on the top, you don't dig it in, and it really boosts the microorganisms content. And it also keeps the weeds down and it also keeps in the moisture. So if you've got a hot dry summer, it's really helping conserve the moisture. I've been using it for years now. I actually also cheat. I say to my tree surgeon, who I use a lot on all sorts of different jobs, when you're passing and you've got a load of this in the back of your lorry, please can you just drop it off? And he will drop it off for free. And lots of tree surgeons will do this because they're collecting it all year round and they don't have always the space to dump it. So this is brilliant if he will come to you and dump a load for you if you can take it. Now I also say to him, please don't have any more than 20% coniferous content in it because the deciduous, it breaks down much faster and it seems to be more beneficial. So it's wonderful stuff. So if you can give someone a, a day with a shredder or get some free or help them apply it to their soil, I tell you, it will improve your soil when you've got this lovely soil heaving with microorganisms. It's better than any fertilizer, I think. Now, another thing that you can do to boost the microorganisms in the soil um, is you can actually now buy a product called The Goop. It's just available in the UK, but I think in America it's been available for some time. And this is a sort of blackish gunge. You dilute it down and you put it into a sprayer or a watering can and you spray it on the surface of the soil. And many crops really respond to it because it's actually full of microorganisms and nematodes. And they're particularly fungi and nematodes. And they will boost the microorganisms in your soil no end. And that really helps release lots of fertilizers that are in the soil and it makes the soil much more healthy. It improves the structure. So it costs around about 30 pounds for about 200 millimetres, which then can be diluted down much further. And you can do repeated dilute applications to the soil, or you can do heavier amounts that treat small, small amount. And you get it from a firm, soilsmiths.co.uk. Now, this is one present that you might not want to put under the tree because it has a shelf life. It does go off quite quickly, so you can give them a voucher instead. But instead of thinking fertilizers and chucking on artificial fertilizers to the soil, go more natural, add these microorganisms, add the ray meal, add things like that, don't dig it, and you'll make your soil so much more healthy and your crops and your plants will grow so much better. You'll enjoy that present all through the year. If you know a gardener that would appreciate 25 pounds in weight worth of free fertilizer every year, then maybe I've got the gift for you. I'm sitting on one now. It's called a toa. And it's a, basically a watering can that you sit on and pee in, and then you can use it for the garden. Now, I hope you're not revolted by the idea because it's got a lot of plus points. I've had one for many years, and I use it to actually put directly onto the compost heap. And it's brilliant because it moistens the heap and it activates it, so it really gets it cooking. So you get your lovely homemade compost much, much quicker. Some people don't actually put it on the heap, some people put it on the garden. But if you're doing that, you need to dilute it. Dilute it by about five to ten times with water, because otherwise it is pretty strong stuff. And the actual breakdown of it, the NPK, nitrogen, phosphate, potassium, is ten to one to four. So it's lots of nitrogen, not a lot of phosphate, which helps the root growth, but quite a bit of potassium which helps with the flowering. So it's really useful stuff and it's been coined liquid gold and I quite agree with that. And some people think, ooh, wee wee, not very nice, nasty germs, etc, etc. But it is sterile, it is totally sterile as it leaves your body, so you cannot actually get harmed from it. 
You shouldn't really put it directly onto the soil, onto growing crops if it's cold. The soil I think needs to be something like 10 degrees C so that the micro is, microorganisms in the soil can break it down nicely. And if you put it straight onto the ground on one plant continually, it will be so acid it will actually burn it. So don't do that. Spread it around this lovely liquid gold. Don't concentrate it in one place. But basically, instead of flushing down, I think it's something like um, 11 litres, three gallons of water. It can be that much of water that you flush down the loo every time you have a pea. Then you're not only saving water, you're getting something for the garden. A fabulous present and I bet you no one's been given that before so it's unique. Now if you want to go for the whole hog and deal with everything that you excrete then you'll obviously need a composting loo. So the toa is brilliant for the liquid but then you need to separate it and you have the composting loo so having done the liquid you go on to the solid. Now I've got here a little camping loo and this is pretty much just a bucket with the lid on it and what you do is every time you've been to the Thunderbox you obviously use recyclable loo paper pop it in and then you put a handful a big handful of sawdust over the top shut the lid down go away. Now when it gets full obviously you need to empty it. And that is the bit that people would find slightly yucky perhaps. And you need to empty it to a hole in the ground and you need to put it in and cover it. And then you leave it for about 12 months. Meanwhile, you use another pit. So you keep them separate. So you leave one for 12 months and then you start the next one. Um, and then after 12 months, you have wonderful night soil that you can spread on the garden. You wouldn't probably spread it on edibles but it's brilliant for shrubs and things like that but actually the dry matter that we excrete per day is 50 grams per person which is tiny and that equates to something like three or four wheelbarrows a year. Now many people now are going the whole hog and instead of having a bucket that you empty they're actually making a whole composting loo so it drops down to a pit and it's treated with sawdust and things quite naturally and it's a brilliant little invention. Now they are more complicated to make, make and if you want to make one then I suggest you get a wonderful little book that's co-authored by Louise Hullstrap and it's called Lifting the Lid and it shows all different techniques how to do it and you might think my god she's mad but I think in 10 years time or so there will be so many composting loos around because we are all getting concerned about what we're chucking into the sea rivers and treating from all of us on the planet that actually we think if we deal with it at source much better much better for the garden the planet and so ultimately for us. And finally, on the poo matter, and I hope I'm not labouring a point, when you come think of dog poo, think of those millions of bags, plastic bags of dog poo that are going into these God knows where every day. Perhaps we should think about the dog poo too. And if I lived in a tiny town garden, what I would do, which lots of clients have done, is I would just dig a little chamber, line it with ply, and it would be something like 40 centimetres um, rectangular and about 600 mil deep. Dig it into the ground, nothing on the bottom, and I would chuck the solids into there. And then you put a lid on the top. And I've had clients that have got massive dogs that have been doing this for years and it just goes, it just rots away, it doesn't smell, it saves all those plastic bags, it saves their garden getting covered in it. I think it's brilliant. And last but not least, instead of that dreadful Christmas jumper, how about a Christmas snood? So I got this cashmere jumper on the internet from eBay for a couple of quid and it was, as you can see, pink and so what I did is I just cut the bit that goes over the body into stripes and they're about 150 mil tranches I cut. So I got several out of it. And the brilliant thing about cashmere and why it has to be cashmere is that it doesn't fray. So instead of having to hem it, and I'm hopeless with a needle, it just rolls up, which is perfect. So you don't see it and it doesn't unpick. And so you have this lovely stretch of material and there's nothing I 
hate more is gardening with a cold neck and head. So I often wear a scarf or a snood and this really does keep your neck warm. And I like to be generous, so I put in two rounds, wrap it round and it's just wonderful. Cozy, warm, bright and beautiful.